Hi, this is Pete Srovavis from Marillion and Transatlantic, and you're listening to the podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. And today I have another British legend calling. <laughs> he's a bass player and he's mostly known for his work with Transatlantic and Marillion, of course. Hi, Pete. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing really well. Thank you. Of course, we want to know everything about the new Transatlantic record that is dropping. Yeah on Friday. So the new Transatlantic album is called The Absolute Universe and it comes in two different uh, versions. The abridged version, it's, it's called, uh, it has the, has the subtitle The Breath of Life and the extended version is called Forevermore. Yeah. It is the fifth yes. Transatlantic it's, album. <laughs> I know, it's, it, was, um, it was just too much. It was just too, too big a project to contain in one album so we had to make two um yeah it's an immense thing um i'm really really proud of it i think we're all really proud of it um it's an incredible thing what's interesting about the two versions is that they're, they're very very different there's you know some of the songs are re-sung um sometimes by different people so for example there's a song called rainbow sky on breath of life is that on Breath of Life? Let me have a look at Breath of Life. Got it here, it's Rainbow Sky. No, Rainbow Sky is on Forevermore, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. And um, and then on, on Breath of Life, that has a completely different title and is sung by Rainer and has kind of been rearranged. And, and Breath of Life has a song called Can You Feel It, which doesn't feature at all. No, there's none of the music features at all in Forevermore. And there's lots of things like that throughout both albums. And, and also, um, both albums were completely separately mixed. Okay. And how that, how that all came about, really, <laughs> was that um, when we left Sweden, we had the bare bones of Forevermore, which is the extended version. And... Um, that's the that's the album we thought we would end up working on, and then of course, COVID happened and lockdowns happened, and rather than having to rush an album, we kind of had a bit more time to play with it, and we did. And while we were all working very separately on the album, we were all doing things to kind of our own versions, I guess. We all had the backing tracks, and Roy was working away, and he was putting loads of layering guitars up and and re-singing stuff and um you know i was doing similar things i put the bass on and i was rewriting lyrics to one or two songs like solitude for example which is one of my songs and neil was working away and um, he was re-singing you know there's a couple of songs that he re-sang um where we ended up in a situation where rather than rather than the four of us kind of combining to make an album, we were kind of going off in different directions. And um, Neil came to Neil, Neil sent an email one day saying, "Look, I've been away from this for a while, and um, you know I've just come back and had another listen, and I think it it would benefit from being shorter." And um, he'd edited it. He said, "Have a listen to this." The the email he sent. Um, was headlined am i crazy <laughs> and uh, but uh, what he'd done is he'd, he'd edited it in a specific way and he'd taken some of the songs you know some of the bits and pieces out of the overture and sort of moved a few songs up slightly so it was a bit more concise but he'd moved one of the themes that i wrote only features on forevermore it only features at the end of the album and in, i remember in in sweden at the time neil was saying Oh, it's, it's funny that this theme isn't is is only just introduced right at the end of the album. That's a bit weird. <laughs> but he what he did is he demoed a version of it uh, for the beginning of the album, and then he sent through his he sent sent through his version, 
and um, and said, well, what what do you guys think? I think this is a really good, you know, more concise, easier listen of the album. And um, obviously, if you like it, we'll have you'll have to replay all the parts that I kind of demoed up. And yeah, we had a decision to make then. Which version were we going to go with? Were we going to go with the classic kind of progressive big event of Forevermore or were, or were we going to go with the more, you know, concise abridged version? So Mike came up with the idea that we didn't have to make a choice because, I mean, there's famously, of course, there's, there's four of us in a band and we always end up when we've got choices to make. It's like two people like one thing, two people like the other thing. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's the Europeans against the Americans and other times... It's different combinations, but invariably we can't decide on something. And we're all quite strong-willed. So Mike said, look, rather than having to decide, let's do two versions. But, you know, it all sounds very different anyway because of the way people have sung things and the way the orchestration has been put down. So that's what we did. And then from that point on, we consciously started um, thinking of ways to... to that both albums could benefit from being different to each other. And that finished up with mi uh, the mixes. Both mixes of the albums were done as separate standalone things. So it wasn't a case of just editing bits of one album and bolting it together to make another one. They were thought of and uh, kind of, you know, almost dreamt up as, as two different things. And what you end up with is two very different journeys of the same experience or two very different experiences, if you like, of the same journey. Well, that, that, that's uh, definitely a, a very unique and uh, uh, cool approach. Um, you mentioned like that all of this happened after uh, the initial songwriting session in Sweden. I yeah, mean, it, it's, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's very well known that you guys, whenever you you're going to do an, a new album as Transatlantic, you meet together to write together in a studio. I I seem to remember for the Whirlwind, you you went to the States uh, to to Neil Morris's right. studio, and this time you were in Sweden. So so I guess for this album, it was the first time that you had that much time afterwards to to like yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Think about it I mean, and 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 record new stuff and 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 all that. Yeah, I mean that's the the you know if anything benefited from COVID, it was the fact that we had more time because what we really expected to happen, and I think what we thought we would be working towards, was to take away from Sweden the the bare bones of the album, all do our bits, you know, play drums, play bass, sort out some harmonies. And then have to have to give it to the record company to to release it, and then you know later in the year we would have gone on tour with it. But of course, because none of that could happen, and there wasn't a there wasn't a the the sort of we weren't pressed for a release date because it didn't really matter. Yeah, you know, there's no point releasing a transatlantic album too far in advance because it's pretty you know it's hard enough finding time for us to get together to tour anyway. So um, it wouldn't have benefited from releasing it early. And in fact, it benefited massively from us being able to tinker with it, you know, and mess about with it. And as well as having the two versions, I should mention that on the Blu-ray, uh, there's a 5.1 mix, which is actually Mike's favorite sections of both versions. So that, and that again was mixed. I mean, 5.1 mixes are very different. You know, they're new mixes by definition because they're being mixed in a different sort of format, if you like. But um, but it was mixed again very differently um, and put together in a hundred minute kind of, yeah, um, sonic dream of Mike Portnoy, I guess <laughs> we can <would> say. <laughs> which is awesome because you know how much Mike is a music lover. I mean, we're all music lovers, which is why I think we get excited about what we do you know and i think that shows i think being I, mean, i think if there's one thing that really shows through with transatlantic it's the fact that we're you know we're music lovers and we we really dig into little things really kind of please us you know bringing themes back or giving a nod to a, a band from the past that we used to favor or or you know worship in some cases um <laughs> 
So it's all cool. Yeah. So the next next transatlantic album is gonna be four versions for every member, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, could well be actually, <laughs> couldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then after that we give we give all of the um all of the stems to the fans and they can mix their own <laughs> or something. <laughs> Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's a ma it was a mammoth. It's a mammoth thing. But and what is cool as well, of course, and one thing I think uh, you can come to expect from Inside Out is the packaging and the way that they really embraced the whole project and went to town with it. You know, mm -hmm. rather than scratching their heads and trying to come up with reasons why we shouldn't do that, <laughs> they were like, "Yeah, let's let's go with that then." Uh, you know, so. So we have to we have to thank Thomas and everybody at Inside Out for that tremendous job, as always. <laughs> and I have the benefit of not only just listening to it in advance, because I've been working on it for a year and a half, probably listened to it too much, actually, if anything. Mm -hmm. But um, but I've seen it all now as well, because it all arrived in our in our um, in our warehouse at, at Racket Records, Meridian's online shop. Um, some of it only arrived today actually but bits of it arrived a bit earlier and uh, the packaging is is great they've done a really good job awesome so yeah uh going back to the songwriting session in sweden i, I always wondered like when you get together and and write um especially of course now looking at the absolute universe and and um that process did did you just like come come home with demos and then do your the, the proper recordings at home or were there also things that you like recorded in Sweden together and that ended up on the album yeah so i mean yes the process always benefits from us being together because there's a real creative spark going around the room when we do that But it starts, I mean, we, we notoriously never have any time to do anything. You know, a week, a week is pretty standard. If, oh, you make an album in a week. You know, that's all the time we've got because someone's got to fly off on tour or someone's got to do something crazy. Um, but we had 10 days in Sweden, so we thought, oh, okay, we can, we might get the drums and the bass down as well. But the only way we can really benefit from working like that is to have songs written in advance. So Neil, myself and Royna presented music in advance that we'd written. And we all familiarised ourselves with it. Uh, but the magic happens when we get together and we start arranging it and we can pull each other's, you know, all, all of the music is up for grabs. Anything can happen to anything. So we'll tear bits apart and we'll build a song out of two or three things from three different places sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Reaching for the Sky is probably a good example where the musically, the verse to Reaching for the Sky is one of my verses and features later on um, in, the, in the album. And, um, and the chorus was a chorus of Neil's. And, uh, and when, we were, when, when we came to kind of work on it, It started out with Neil saying, "Well, that that'd be good. That your core, your verse is good. Let's you know. Let's have your verse." And then he thought, "Be really good with my, you know." <laughs> so um, yeah, we just build. You know, we build stuff from there. And when we get, if if we ever get stuck, which is very rare, we very rarely get stuck for somewhere to go. But if we do, there's always everybody's got like five or six ideas that they want to. They want to share and say, well, I've got an idea where what to do here or, or, or Michael wave, wave his hand in the air and say, no, no this, is, this is what I want us to do here. Because <laughs> Mike is kind of the big arranger. Mike doesn't do so much. He doesn't get involved in the writing so much with Transatlantic, but he has a big plan normally. <laughs> of, of, and, um, and that's a good, it's a good thing. Actually, it's very fitting that drummers are very, very good at working out what should happen next. I think working with rhythms so much, they just have a sense of, you know, what should happen and and, and, and how it should happen. <laughs> They're very good at set, building set lists, for example, for the same kind of reasons. They understand when you need a lull and when you need to, you know, get crazy or, 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 or build something up again. So... Um, 
so having that having that to kind of mic at the helm i guess uh with everybody else you know coming up with the musical ideas is is um is quite a good way for us to work obviously it's worked quite well in the past and and seems to have, seems to have worked well in um on this album too cool so once you get down to recording uh what is your weapon of choice speaking of basses and uh uh yeah that kind of stuff yeah so um normally i would go into a studio if i didn't record the bass at the studio we were in so for example with the whirlwind and i think with kaleidoscope i recorded at Na in nashville with jerry cadrews who was the uh, engineer yeah but um with this album i recorded at home but i've always recorded with a i've got an old warwick thumb bass and it's um i think it's an 84 uh, i got it i was given it brand new actually <laughs> which um because at the time warwick had just kind of come out they hadn't they weren't very um well known bases and um so yeah i have two of their original thumb bases and this particular one just suits well it suits me because i played it for years <laughs> so it's kind of really played in and it just it always sounds good and um so yeah because i was recording at home i didn't have the luxury of of an engineer kind of helping me with studio sounds or anything and i don't really trust myself to get bass sounds i always bass sounds are really funny things <laughs> i find so and luckily i usually surround myself with people who understand how to get good bass sounds so um i thought well, the best thing i can do is just go direct so i just went direct in with a, a, the sound of a bass that i knew i could trust you know keeping the strings of the one of the tricks well one of the start a trick one of the things i do is um i change strings regularly because i want a kind of quite bright sharp kind of tone and i use a pick a lot i mean i use i use fingers or a pick depending on what kind of thing i'm doing you know softer songs um i would use a, a my fingers but if i want a lot of precision i know that if there's a lot of riffing or anything like that um i tend to use a pick um and if i want a really kind of bright wiry sound i tend to find a softer pick like a medium as opposed to a heavy pick normally if i'm playing live i want a heavy pick otherwise they just break in five <laughs> minutes um because i'm i'm uh, i'm a bit of a beast when it comes to playing um but if i'm in the studio and i want a certain uh, you know a very bright kind of wiry sound i'll probably use a slightly softer pick um so it's really a lot of it is down to the sound a lot of the sound is down to how i play and where on the neck i play you know sometimes i'll play nearer the neck with so I'll, the the front nearer the front pickup between the front pickup and the neck of the guitar uh, uh other times if i want more aggression i might go to the back nearer nearer the um nearer the back pickup the uh, the bridge pickup <laughs> How, how dare I forget what the bits of the bass are called, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in lockdown too long. I haven't done anything apart from, yeah, back um, about. And, and you, is it the same bass you, you would play for a Meridian as well? Yeah, I tend to. I tend to. It, it's kind of my go-to bass. I have two or three Warwick basses that I use. and uh, But, you know, I have, I have about 40 or 50 basses at home. Uh, or in the studio most of them are in the studio actually because i don't have the room but you know so depending on what i'm doing and what kind of song I, i might i might go for a fender jazz i like fender jazzes or a precision or i've got a um i've got an epiphone violin bass <laughs> which is the epiphone violin bass is a copy of the hofner violin bass but the hofner violin bass was a semi-acoustic copy of the original gibson violin but viola bass which was a solid bodied bass and um famously used by um the the Bee Gees actually and I can't remember which Bee Gee it was that played bass but he used a 
a Gibson Viola bass. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> but that's, a, that's by the by. So I recorded straight into the um, into my computer using Cubase. Actually, I used Cubase Nine, and um, which is fairly old now. I've I've just updated it, but. Um, I didn't want to update it in the middle of a session. That would be a disaster. That's a big no-no. <laughs> Never update anything if you're doing something in the middle of something important. I've learned that before. Um, and then I sent I sent all my base files off to uh, Reiner because Reiner has uh, an Ampeg set up and he reamped the bass. So he got the nice valve distortion sound. And then both the amp sound and the dry sound were sent to Rich mauser who um mixed the album and he's the album the, <laughs> plural the, the albums yeah the albums or everything the whole he he mixed the whole universe actually um, the absolute universe yeah he did he mixed the absolute universe and um it probably felt like it for him i must say because it's a it's a heck of a project to get stuck into but um and then he will probably knowing rich he will have like those two channels and then he'll put it through one of his boxes that he really likes for certain things and then he'll like oh and then i i i i put it through this little kind of phaser that i have because it's got a really cool sound because he's one of these people he loves his outboard gear <laughs> he's a real analog outboard gear kind of guy which i love so he gets he, he gets good good kind of retro sounds if that's what you're after and i think transatlantic kind of benefit a lot from that there's a bit of a nostalgia thing to some of the some of the stuff we play, which I think is cool. Totally cool with that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Any anything new with your other main band, Marillion? What you guys have been up to? <laughs> oh, Marillion has been up to um, well. Yeah, we um, we took last year off. Actually, this is a what are we now? Beginning of twenty two? No, we begin at twenty one, aren't we? <laughs> So we took 2020 off because we wanted to write a new album. And although we'd started writing it and we had a lot of starting points and we'd done a lot of jamming, we wanted to really dig in and get, get the album written. And then, of course, with COVID, we had lots of restrictions on how we could record and when we could go to our studio. We were in lockdown for a while. And then we were in a, you know, we were in various situations where because of because of certain members health and and because of certain restrictions in certain parts of the country, we couldn't all get together in our studios. So basically, we had to do a lot of stuff remotely, which didn't really help. I mean, it all helps, but it didn't really help us move the album on uh, the way we wanted it to, because really we work better when we're all in a room together. That is really how. That's the strength, a strength for Meridian, a big strength for Meridian, like with Transatlantic as well. Is um, I mean, with, the, with, is, that, is, with that, is with, working together. Yeah, yeah, with with that Meridian lineup, I mean, you've been, you guys have m played music together since 1989, right? Yeah, in that formation, yeah. <laughs> in that constellation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we have. Yeah, so it's, it's. I mean, it's amazing, but yeah, so we have that kind of second sense second sight kind of thing um and um you know we slowly did we got back together we did manage to work as a five piece with well i should say a six piece because our producer mike hunter um has been working on this you know diligently for the last two or three years um and it, it's it's moving forward we have a plan to move forward we're still in lockdown in the UK, Same we, Germany, we are yes. banned from traveling, basically. Yeah. And that doesn't include, as well as traveling abroad, that's that's traveling, you know, further than you need to go to. You know, essential travel is allowed. Um, so we're kind of, we're, 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 we're waiting to be able to, you know, carry on in a more productive way with the album. It's slowly happening. It's slowly happening. But we're having to work in kind of, twos and threes and fours at the moment which um which makes it a bit of a slower process but we're working on very very good ideas we've got some great ideas and some great pieces of music so 
we're kind of hopeful that it's um it's gonna you know it's gonna get there and happen i mean the big thing about marillion from our point of view is that we've released lots of albums and we have a huge fan base and a very dedicated fan base and the last thing we should do is to rush release an album because we feel that the fans want some new music because if it's not up to the standard of the last two or three albums then there's no point you know we'd be shooting ourselves in the foot so that's kind of our take on it is that it takes as long as it takes <laughs> you know and that is the um that's actually the way we feel with very strongly you know there's no point in us rushing it we've got really we've got nothing to prove but we we have got new music and we want to get it in a presentable shape and form and when we feel it's ready it will happen the, the the great unveiling will happen <laughs> great <laughs> looking forward to that uh, yeah, yeah. With, with transatlantic uh the first time you guys got together was uh yeah 2000 for smpte and uh you've known the guys for a long time now and i i wondered uh do you have any favorite flower kings uh spock speared on neil morse and any mike portner project songs from your bandmates that you particularly love uh yes <laughs> i do yeah i do um god what's it called what's the flower king's album called something of eden uh banks of eden banks of eden the banks of eden yeah yeah interestingly enough i um the first time i heard some of that album was on um a um cruise to the edge and flower kings were playing oh, i love flower kings i mean jonas what a bass player <laughs> i mean he's one of my he's a he's a he's one of my kind of favorite bass players and um he's a he's a lovely love top guy as well um but yeah i've i i was listening to this this music and then um i went up to Rainer afterwards I said, what was that? What were you playing? What was that? You know, like whichever song it was, I really liked. And he said, oh, yeah, he said, that's from Banks of Eden. <laughs> so um, I went, I bought the album. I went online to the shop, to uh, to Rona's shop, because I thought I didn't want to, I didn't want to ask, you know, I didn't want to say, oh, yeah, can you get us a copy of that? Because <laughs> it's not like I can't afford to support a fellow, you know, musician. So I went and bought it. With, and um, and I'm very pleased I did. And Spock's beard. I first saw Spock's beard before um, we um, we got together with Transatlantic. So uh, I'd never met Royner before, and I'd never really met Neil. But I saw Spock's beard live because I thought, well, I should probably go and see them. <laughs> and they were playing at a little place called well, it wasn't little, uh, a, a place called the Astoria. In London, kind of quite famous, iconic, yeah, kind of quite a big club. Can't remember how many it held, but it's quite big for London clubs, and um, they were amazing. <laughs> they were absolutely they blew me away. And um, so yeah, I got into the light, and um, I looked up. I mean, one of my favourite songs is "Go Your Own Way." Actually. Oh, go the way go, you go. Go the way you go, yeah. Go the go yeah, go your own way is of course Fleetwood Mac, isn't it? <laughs> um yeah, go the way you go. That's a fantastic song. I love that. Yeah. Great theme. Great um great music. Yeah. Great music. I agree. But I mean there's yeah, I mean there's what is well, there's lots of it, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they've written some some very good music. I think Ted's Ted's got gone in really well, actually. Yeah, I've yeah, I've yeah, seen a lot of Ted's, um, you know, being a front man more recently, and um, I think he's he, he he does a great job in there. Yeah, because that's not that's not an easy gig, <laughs> you know. <laughs> There's a lot to do in in Spock's beard. Yeah, and uh, I mean, uh, did did you uh did you check out the new uh the new project the guys have with pre uh, the 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 pre um the ah uh, 
Yes, I know the. I know what you mean. I know the one you mean. I, I always, uh, no, I haven't. I haven't. I I've always just... confuse them with the uh, with the prehistoric animals. That's a very cool Swedish uh, prog rock band. It is. But they're it is. they're uh, pattern seeking animals. Yes. Pattern seeking animals. <laughs> yes. No, I haven't checked it out yet. Actually. Yeah, they 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 released their out, second album last year. Already, I'm lazy. I'm, already I'm on bit... the second album. <laughs> yeah, I'm they've sure. been busy. I'm sure, <laughs> they are. Uh, and of course, then you got you got Mike and Neil in Flying Colors with Steve Morse. True, that's. And um, yeah, the first Flying Colors I loved very very much back then. Oh my God, I can't remember the name of the bass player. What's the bass player called? Amazing bass player, actually. Uh yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> He's he's um of course he's from Dixie Dregs as well, isn't he? With um with Steve Morse. Dave no, not Dave. Dave LaRue. Dave LaRue, Dave yeah. is Dave LaRue. I'm thinking, no, I'm thinking of Dave Morose, but Dave LaRue, yeah. <laughs> he's yeah, he yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. And um and I'm I've just listened to a bit of the latest Liquid Tension album, Li Li Liquid Tension <laughs> Experiment album yeah. as well. And that's, I mean, yeah, the first I, I love the first was, two. Was, was I love the first two albums. So, yeah. looking forward to that as well. Yeah, cool so thing. A, one, one of the other things, of course, is that there's a, been a lot of music come out of the lockdown situation with musicians not being able to tour. They've really taken it upon themselves to, um, you know, to get creative with other musicians which yeah. is cool it's great for the listener and of course well needed because we've all been getting a bit bored haven't we yeah. and there's only so much netflix you can watch right <laughs> the cool thing is i uh last year with the flower kings album and then with neil morse's uh, album i had the uh, the pleasure to talk to both here on the show to to Royne and to neil now yeah. i had now i had you on the show and of course, I, there's only one transatlantic member missing now. Uh, I hope I'll He's get... He's a tough one. He's a tough one to get hold of. <laughs> I hope I'll get him for the Liquid Tension Experiment release in I'm sure March. you will. I'm sure you will. <laughs> so we you talked... Should, to... <laughs> you should go for Mike and and, um, and John at the same time. That would be a cool interview. Yeah. But on the other hand, I also uh, had the pleasure to speaking to Jaco Chakchik and... Uh, uh, Gavin Harrison already, and I'm going to yeah. talk to Pat Mastelotto next week. Um, so it, it would also be great to have Tony Levin, <laughs> obviously, because he is he's, sure. he's one of the For best sure. bass players out yeah. there, right? <laughs> he is. He's such a cool guy. Yeah. He is such a cool guy as well. I've I've met I've only met him a couple of times. But such a nice fellow, such a cool guy. I, I had uh, I saw him oh, probably in eight nine years ago with the Stickman in a yeah. small club here that's in a, Munich. That's a trip, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I right. know. Yeah, yeah. We talked about the uh, some some of your favorite stuff from the other four uh, from the other three band members of Transatlantic. Now I'm. Um, this might be a, a little bit of an odd question, or or maybe a. a too big of a question. Is there any f favorite Marillion song that you personally love the most? <laughs> oh, that's a really tough one, isn't it? That's like asking somebody which is your favorite child, you know? Um, yeah, I probably do. I probably do. I know, and it kind of varies from time to time. Um, live, I've got some favorite live tracks. I do like playing Gaspacho live. Because that's got a, that's got that kind of Chris Squire swagger to it. <laughs> but although it's a very commercial verse, and then the chords in the chorus go all over the place, which is cool. Um, I really like the Invisible Man because it just goes through lots and lots of places. That's that's a great one uh, in terms of build up. And... It's a good presentation. Yeah, it's a good presentation for the band. And funnily enough, we um, we supported we supported Deep Purple a few years ago in Germany and France, bits of France, but mostly Germany. And um, and of course, you know, we were playing in these arenas, and um, we weren't expecting many people to be really that bothered about what we were doing. 
So we thought, well, we better put Kaylee in because nobody will know who we are. <laughs> but we wanted to do, as well as doing that, that was our concession to the to people who didn't know who we were. The rest of it, we were quite self-indulgent and we started with The Invisible Man. <laughs> and it went down, It went. people really got into it. Sweet. And of course, with the That's visuals, because nice. we were allowed to use the screen as well, yeah. which I thought was very, very courteous of yeah. um, Deep Purple, very yeah. gentlemanly. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of bands would say, no, you're not... Yeah. You're not using a screen. Get away from me. <laughs> You're the support band. You know. <laughs> I, I saw I saw the purple two times here in Munich in the Olympia uh, Hall, and yeah, the, yeah. Fir the first time was actually with the Swiss hard rockers of Gotthard when Steve Lee was still around and doing his yeah. great vocals. That was the the support band. The first time around, I saw the Deep Purple. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we're reaching the end of our interview. Uh, at the at the very end, we have a little tradition, and that's a section that we like to call "What's in Your Walkman," where I like to ask my guests what they've been listening to lately, if they have anything they want to um, recommend to our listeners. And oh to my your fans. goodness, that's <laughs> a horrible question because I don't, I kind of don't listen. Um, the, there's always two answers to these, aren't there? There's the You can either be really honest and mention your Kylie Minogue and a bit of Simply Red or whatever, <laughs> or you can be as cool as anything and just mention lots of cool stuff. Um, what should I do? What should I do? Totally I up can't to think you. what I've been listening to it recently, actually. Recently added. What's recently added? Oh, God. Um, a lot of the stuff I listen to, and this is the truth, a lot of the stuff I listen to is just simply stuff I'm working on myself. Um, I must have stuff I was listening to recently. Now, while, you, while you think, I, I will put in my recommendation for this week. And with, yeah. the, with a prog rock theme going on and this kind of super group theme, there was one particular re release last year that um, kind of sounded like another prog rock super group a little bit. Um, the band there they've been probably very much influenced by was uh, of course Emerson Lake and Palmer and I'm talking about Norwegian band called Ring Van Mobius and their new oh. album Third Majesty is a killer album if you dig the Emerson Lake and Palmer kind of sound lots of lots of keyboards and Hammonds it's it's a lot of fun to listen to so it's a it's a must hear if you if you're into ELP And uh, the other one would be um, uh, a, an American uh, prog rock band called Theo from organist and keyboardist uh, Jim Alfredson, if I remember correctly his name. And they also have a, a new album out called Figureheads. And it was also really cool prog rock stuff. And those two albums, I think, are two prog rock albums from 2020 that uh, deserve a, a little bit of a bigger audience. So... Uh, go out and check this out if you're into prog rock. Um, and I also wanted to, to to let you guys know my favorite Marillion songs. Actually. Yeah, please do. <laughs> I mean, um, as a as a bass groove lover, I played bass a little bit myself, but my favorite bass groove is on If My Heart Were a Ball, It Would Roll Uphill. Oh, yeah, <laughs> in yeah. The live Now, version on Anorak that's in the UK. That's quite a heavy kind of Nine Inch nails -y kind of approach. Yeah, but as far as a favorite song goes, that would be the space. The space. That's yeah. a cool song. We did a great version of that um, just before lockdown, actually, with uh, an orchestra. Well, we had uh, we had a string quartet, a flute, and uh, French horn, uh, which was very lovingly arranged for us by um, Mike Hunter. And we did a tour with these musicians, and and the space was just. It was just great because, of course, the strings were playing the, the string parts at the beginning. And it was lovely. Yeah. Do you know what? I'm such <laughs> I, 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 I wish I'd known in advance because I could have got my answers ready. But no I'm worries. trying to wreck my brain of stuff that I've listened to recently. Um, the truth is, you know, that I'm, I quite often And I'm sure, I don't know whether other musicians are like this, but I get guilty because I'm, I'm, I'm usually working on two or three projects at the same time. 
And if I just start listening for pleasure, I get guilty. I'm thinking I shouldn't be listening to this. I should be listening to, you know, if I'm if I'm listening to this, then I've got time to mix that, or I've got time to listen to that and see what what I think of that, or I, you know, whatever it is I'm supposed to be working on. So, the truth is, I don't keep up to date with what's going on, really. Check check out the check out those bands I've mentioned, and also will. also will. the yeah, pattern yeah, seeking yeah. animals. Um, I think uh, you, you you probably would dig them as well. <laughs> And of course, I should I should li I should listen to the island by Flower Kings as well. Yeah, <laughs> that's the um, that was last year's release, wasn't it? That's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting confused with my years now. <laughs> yeah. I seem to I seem to spend a lot of time doing the same thing, walking from my house to my studio and back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um... Pete, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, absolutely lovely talk. Um, I hope the next time we see each other will be on the road again. Yeah, but at I this hope point, so. we we don't know when that will be. Um, we don't. Although um, Marie and I are planning to do some shows in Germany later this year, but whether they'll be cancelled, I don't know. Of course, but if 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 you guys are gonna uh, come here. I'm sure we we can uh, do a follow up to this episode um, in I'll person. I'll make a point of listening to some new new music for you as well. <laughs> All right, and give you some recommend. <laughs> Actually, I tell you what, I think I I want to listen to is the new um, Randy McSteen and and Marco Miniman album. Oh yeah, that, that's a that's a great. Uh, great thing i know that... I've, i've read about it i haven't got around to listen to it yet <laughs> that's actually sometimes sometimes i also do that because uh like mentioning an album that i haven't listened to yet in this section because the person i'm talking to or the band we are talking yeah. about reminded me that there was this album that i wanted to listen to um mm. because of some connection maybe musical or um personnel wise um, so so I've done that before as well. I mentioned oh, that's cool. I mentioned an album that I wanted to listen to and and like kind of took it as an as a kick in the butt to finally do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And yeah. and I I also have to admit I I've seen one funny video from that one but I haven't listened to the whole album. Right. Um so that's a Good call, and uh, we're gonna check it out. I'm gonna put it together a huge playlist, of course, with transatlantic stuff. It's gonna be a little bit longer and very epic. <laughs> But cool. yeah, I'm gonna put uh, together a playlist as always that's gonna accompany this episode. Thank you so much for taking the time, Pete. It's a pleasure, man. It's a pleasure. Take care, and uh, yeah, thank you all for listening out there. Absolutely. Thank you guys out there for listening as always. And as always also, take care of yourselves, take care of your loved ones and listen to great music. Absolutely. The Progcast is a production of Stuus Media and is presented by the Prague Space. It is produced by Randy M. Salo, Janine Stengel-Lewis, Blake Lewis and Dario Albrecht. Our theme music is by This Is Not An Elephant, and Van Kirsch does our graphics. New episodes of the podcast drop every Monday and Thursday. And don't miss our Friday Top 5 episode where we discuss our favorite new releases from that week. For more interviews and reviews in the written form, check out theprogspace.com. <laughs>